Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first episode, maybe, <laughs> hopefully not the last episode of uh, the Firm Returns podcast. Um, I I do apologise in advance. It's probably going to be a shambles. Um, I've never done anything like this before, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And hopefully, uh, if uh, if it works out even remotely well, I'm trying to keep improving these as time goes on. Uh, so yeah. Firm Returns uh, is a little project I've started. Um, you can find it's effectively stop write-ups um, with a value investing focus. Uh, you find a few over on firmreturns.com. So I've got a few companies I've done on there, um, all of which I, I own in my portfolio. That, that won't always be the case. Um, some I might write up and and uh, decide not to buy in the future, but it's largely I'm largely doing it as a way to add some extra due diligence to my own investing process. So uh, yeah, it's, it's largely for me, and uh, I just thought I'd publish some of this stuff just to see if anybody else is going to get some some extra benefit from it possibly as well um, but yeah it, it just forces me to really do go that extra mile with my research anyway yeah so yeah some some past examples I've done I've done like Taylor Maritime investment stock analysis Aviva the uh, life insurer so the Taylor Maritime is a it's a dry bulk shipping company holds a bit a portfolio of companies in there you've got Aviva life insurer Samara Enterprises uh, concrete leveling business US business but listed on the London Stock Exchange um, so yeah, those three were all London listed I'm but I'm uh, from the UK so the London Stock Exchange is my my local stock exchange uh, and then we've got yeah the most recent one I've done uh, which is what I'm going to talk about today is Warner Brothers Discovery which uh, is listed on the Nasdaq so a bit of a, a move away from the London market for me it was a good experience of uh, reading gap accounting rather than IFRS and and getting used to the the dif all the different report types you get in the US 10Ks, 10Qs, etc. That we generally get um, annual and interim reports here in the UK, so a little bit different uh, in terms of the content and them and stuff, but generally I think much the same. So let's get let's get cracking. Um, I'm sure a lot of you, well, most people, have heard of uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, or at least they'll have heard of those names, did not necessarily knowing that it was a combined business. Uh, so I'm just going to have a go through my my write up for this. So we will just have a look. First off, we start off with a business overview, so we we'll get a general idea of what. Warner Brothers Discovery. So Warner Brothers Discovery is a leading global media and entertainment company with a portfolio of content and brands across film, television and streaming. It has a presence in over 220 countries and territories and produces content in 50 different languages. An incomplete list of all its iconic brands and products includes the following. Discovery Channel, Discovery Plus, CNN, DC, Eurosport, HBO, HBO Max, HGTV, Food Network, OWN, Investigation Discovery, TLC, Magnolia Network, TNT, TBS, True TV, Travel Channel, Motor Trend, Animal Planet, Science Channel, Warner Brothers Pictures, Warner Brothers Television, Warner Brothers Games, New Line Cinema, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, and Turner Classic Movies. Whew. I need to take a breath after that. So it's got a lot of a lot of uh, IP and a lot of uh, different brands. The business can be broadly divided into three segments: studios, networks, and direct-to-consumer, which we use abbreviate to DTC. Studios contains the production, release, licensing, and distribution of feature films and television programs, with the addition of themed experience licensing and interactive games. So that's like the uh, the Warner Brothers interactive games there will be the Warner Brothers games like the Batman games and stuff like that though are quite popular and Harry Potter yeah, Harry Potter games as well I need to believe there's a new one coming out soon uh, Networks encompasses the company's global television networks and DTC includes premium pay TV and digital content services 
The company as it stands today was formed from the merger on the 8th of April 2022 of Discovery Inc. with AT&T's WarnerMedia business. The resultant company is more than three times larger than Discovery and as you'd expect from such a merger is undergoing a costly and uncertain integration process. Uncertain situations like this can create significant mispricing that in turn provides an attractive opportunity for investors able to look past the short-term turbulence. So in this write-up I'll try to explore the question of whether one of us discovery falls into this category and attempt to separate the risk from the present uncertainty. Next up, I uh, going to go through the details of the merger. Um, so it's quite complex, but I hopefully this this breakdown will uh, explain it all to you fairly clearly. So. Before we go into the details, let's just have a look at the the rough you know, outline, the motivations for it, as described by the uh, the management of Discovery. The, the primary attraction is a highly coveted asset portfolio, including many big franchises like Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, DC, and Lord of the Rings, coupled with access some of to some of the best creative talent in the industry. Further, there's the potential for a direct-to-consumer DTC product that combines the content libraries of both businesses. HBO Max is more event-driven. People come to watch specific shows like House of the Dragon or Succession, but also has greater churn, meaning people leave after watching the show that drew them to the platform. Discovery Plus, on the other hand, is much more oriented towards daily viewing, with people often leaving it on in the background while cooking, eating, etc., and it has content for the whole household. A, combine, a combined portfolio would have the hit shows that draw people to the product and also the daily viewing that keeps them subscribed. Another motivation for the merger was the potential for operational synergies. One such synergy is the use of Discovery's linear TV network to market Warner Media content, thus cutting advertising expenses. A second is the consolidation of operating of operations at all levels of management, therefore reducing costs and improving operating margins. So the management gave the expectation that the merger synergies would create three billion dollars of value annually, um, and as we'll see later on, that's been revised to three to three and a half billion. The merger was financed by a combination of debt and equity, executed through a reverse Morris Trust type transaction. This involved the creation of a new company within AT&T, which uh, called Spinco, uh, for Spin Company, to hold the Warner Media assets and liabilities. Shares in Spinco were then issued to AT&T AT shareholders, which would later be converted to Warner Brothers Discovery shares on completion of the merger. The eventual ratio was approximately one Warner Brothers Discovery share for every four AT&T shares. So the debt component of the merger was arranged as follows. Spinco borrowed a total of $41.5 billion, $10 billion of which came from a term loan facility and the remaining $31.5 billion from the issuance of new notes. The cash borrowed was used to make a special cash payment to AT&T of $24,443 million or $24.443 billion, $24 billion, followed by an additional payment of $13 billion. The now leveraged Spinco company was then acquired by Discovery through the issuance of new equity. The purchase price paid based on the distribution of 1,732 million or 1.732 billion new shares at a closing price of $24.43 was $42,376,000,000. Comparing this value to the amount of debt assumed, we can see a fairly equal split between debt and equity financing. The allocation of the purchase price to assets acquired and liabilities assumed from the Q3-10Q filing is detailed in the table below. A notable component is the $21,862,000,000 of goodwill 
which is in effect the amount paid over the calculated fair value of the current assets minus the liabilities. So yeah, and then I've got a table uh, which is uh, I've redone, but it's the data is straight from this uh, Q3 filing, and it's uh, it's just a breakdown of the updated preliminary allocation uh, of the total consideration paid. So it just it breaks it down. So we've got cash amounts, accounts receivable, other current assets, film and television library, property and equipment goodwill, intangible assets, other non-current assets, current liabilities, debt assumed, deferred income taxes and other non-current liabilities. So you could just, you add up all of those things together and you're left with, um, well, the, the negative, take away all the, the liabilities from the assets and you're left with the goodwill, which is the figure I highlighted above. Um, and then the combined sum of all those together gives you a total consideration of as we said before, 42 billion, 376 million. So you can see that this is pretty close to the 41 and a half billion dollars of debt uh, um, that was issued as well. So it's a fairly equal split between debt and equity um, in, the, in uh, terms of total consideration. So the management also breaks down the intangible assets acquired into a number of components with their estimated fair values and weighted average useful lives as follows. Um, so just for reference, the total intangible assets that were listed um, in that pre uh, preliminary allocation were 44 uh, billion, 889 million. So this figure can be broken down into trade names, which are 21 billion, and 84 million uh, and they had a weighted average useful life of 25 years affiliate advertising and subscriber relationships which are 14.7 billion and had a weighted average useful life of six years and then we've got franchises which were 7.9 billion and a weighted average useful life of 35 years so even bigger than the the trade names and then we've got 1.2 billion of, of other intangible assets. So it, following the merger, AT&T shareholders owned 71% of the combined company and Discovery shareholders 29%. And as we mentioned earlier, this is a, I think this is a condition of the reverse Morris Trust type transaction that the spin up, the, the spun off company, the shareholders in the spun off company have to own a majority of the shares in the combined entity afterwards. So something else worth mentioning while on the topic is that it isn't the only major acquisition Discovery has made in recent years. So back in 2018, the company acquired Scripps, which in the year of acquisition represented approximately 55% of Discovery's total assets and 29% of its total revenues. As far as I can tell, Scripps was successfully integrated into Discovery which bodes well for the latest merger. So next I, uh, I break down the segments of the, of the business. So as we mentioned before, they were studios, networks, and direct-to-consumer, or DTC. So um, yeah, well, again, a lot, all the figures used here are gonna come from the Q3 10Q filing. Um, and I've given a little note here at the beginning which says given that the merger occurred on the 8th of April 2022 historical comparison to discovery financials is in many cases not meaningful helpfully management has given us some pro forma combined figures which illustrate the hypothetical results had the merger occurred on the 1st of January 2021 but do not account for any potential merger synergies so yeah the pro forma just uh, um, combined results uh, have the include the actual figures which will just be discovery because in this accounting method in the way they've they've done the account so the entity for the historically from the merger was discovery and then everything sort of so it's, it's treated as if, as if discovery acquired the warner media assets even though they represented a larger component of the business afterwards um, as we said before, the combined entity is about three times 
what discovery was before. So two thirds is going to be the uh, all the media assets. So first up, we look at the the nine months ended 30th of September 2022 for the studio segment, and we have a look at the operating results, and we can see a breakdown here. Um, I'll just I'll just run through the the comments I've made. Uh, you can have a look at the table yourself uh, for this by uh, looking at the article. But prior to the merger, Discovery didn't have any studios business worth talking of. So pretty well all of the revenues are attributable attributable to Warner Media. Year over year, pro forma revenues increase slightly, four percent, including foreign exchange. An adjusted EBITDA increased by a substantial 45%, excluding foreign exchange, from 1,425 million. Operated income turned positive compared to a $403 million loss the previous year. So, the key thing, yeah, just I'll quickly just summarize a couple of things from the table so most of the revenue comes from so the revenues are broken down by type so you've got advertising distribution content and other and that you see the same thing with all of the different segments that's how they break them down so for the studio segment um, content was the largest contributor so back in uh, so in this in this period the, the pro forma adjustments here are effectively just going to be f because it's the merger occurred on the eighth of April, twenty twenty two, and this is for the nine months from starting the, from the first of January up to the thirtieth of September. So there's the period from first of January to the eighth of April is going to be just discovery. And as discovery didn't have any sort of meaningful component there, we have to make the pro forma adjustment to add in. Uh, in this case, for content, three billion. Nine eight hundred ninety eight million dollars, um, which is what Warner Media uh, created in terms of revenue in their content uh, content type revenue in this studio segment in those uh, in that in those few months, and uh, add them together, we get the so in in the period since then we've had five point five billion and the total combined that's uh, pro forma combined content was nine billion four hundred twenty three million and this is compared to so when you add up all the different revenue types the total revenues in the pro forma combined was nine point nine five six billion so there's about five hundred million attributable to other uh, revenue streams within this segment and then we get the adjusted EBITDA, which is the effect of the, the wait, I'll, I'll highlight this um, elsewhere, I think I'll give a proper definition, but it's effectively taking, it's the earnings, or sorry, the revenues taking away the cost of revenues and uh, sales general administrative, but it excludes things like stock-based compensation, and any kind of depreciation and amortization and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that but that that figure comes out at one point nine eight one billion. So comparing that to the revenue, we've got a yeah the the revenue of nine point nine five six billion and adjusted be the a bit of one point nine eight one billion. But then the operating income uh, was only so once you do factor in all of the depreciation and amortization and stock-based compensation and so on uh, you are left with 49 million so it's basically break-even and that's what I go on to say in this segment here and and actually if it wasn't for the uh, a contribution of 990 million from Warner Media in those first few months of the year in the pro forma adjustments the actual figure for the rest of that period so sort of roughly two quarters was a loss of 941 million so uh, they cancel out to to give you just 49 million there so 
let's continue. As we as can be seen, the studio segment is fairly break even at the moment. The task of management is going to be to better exploit the content and improve the efficiency of the operations so revenues grow and a greater share makes it down to the bottom line. So one thing worth mentioning at this point is that it is likely the company is currently making less money licensing its content for internal use by in in DTC products than it could be by licensing it out to third parties. However, this can be viewed as an investment in the DTC segment which could eventually pay off if it becomes sustainably profitable. Another factor is the challenging environment in which the business has operated in recent years. The pandemic has had a large impact on the ability of the studios to produce content and the initial release of feature films in theatres, which is crucial to the overall sales momentum of a film. The business has yet to fully recover from this, but there are twice as many theatrical releases planned in, for 2023 versus 2022. So that's promising. For the so next we move on to the network segment. So for the network segment, um, I say I think it is useful to look first at the pro forma operating results for the nine months ended 30th of September 2021, as both Discovery and Warner Media generated considerable revenues within this segment. So the network segment is all of the linear media, though their cable TV channels and so on. Um, so with this, we can see that the when we look at the revenue breakdown by type, we can see that most of it, there's only a small portion of it is for content this time. Most of it is coming from distribution and advertising. So I've said here, yeah, when looking at these results, the actual column, so the fig figures here on, on the left, can be translated to discovery and the pro forma adjustments column to Warner Media. This is because we're looking back a year before, so complete. There's no a no point in this period where the two companies combined. So um, you can completely separate the pro forma adjustments. Effectively, just adding on all of the the Warner Media results um, to give you just the, the the sum of the two independent businesses, what their revenues added up to, without any kind of synergies or cost cuttings or whatever factored in there. So we can see that, let's just have a look here. Um, yeah, I'll just read out what I've written, which is uh, there are a few notable points to draw from these figures. The first is that both businesses produced similar revenues and adjusted EBITDA. We can see, however, that a much greater proportion made it down to the operating income for Discovery than Warner Media. The reason for this is that the Warner Media business recognized much greater depreciation and amortization uh, three point and I put in brackets here three point one eight two billion versus four hundred and uh, sorry seven hundred and ninety four million dollars uh, we'll see that in the 2022 figures that this level of DNA depreciation more depreciation and amortization has continued so yeah I just just give you the actual figures so you've got them in you've got them for reference um, so revenues wise, um, they both produced fairly similar revenues. So Discovery produced 8.393 billion and Warner Media produced 9.802 billion. So the total com combined together was 18.195 billion. But the interesting bit here is, uh, yeah, and they both produced, when you look map down to the adjusted EBITDA, um, both of them produced just over four billion, uh, so it's four point oh four for Discovery and four point two two nine for uh, Warner Media. But yeah, the, the interesting bit I was alluding to and, and referencing there was that the operating income for Discovery was three point two eight seven billion, while for Warner Media it was only six hundred and eleven million. So you can see there was a there's a lot more. Uh, being taken off they effectively well I think it as I was referenced here it was a lot more depreciation and amortization going on here so um, the yeah the, the content rights and so on are being amortized and the various other things are being the value of them is being depreciated away much more rapidly um, according to the, the their accounting metrics so 
let's have a look at the the latest results uh, which includes as we've said before nearly two post merger quarters so because the merger was on the 8th of april um so and this is the period going up to the 30th of september 2022 so there's no as 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 we had with the when we're looking at the studio segment there's no clear separation between the discovery and warner media business results in the you, know, you can't say this all all the actual column is discovery and all the pro forma adjustments are warner media because there's a bit of a, a mix here so same kind of story again uh, that we saw with the previous year that the advertising and distribution made up the bulk of the the revenues here um and yeah something that's quite interesting actually when i looked at this and i think i mentioned it a little bit further down is that with the discovery business the largest figure was the largest contributor to revenue was advertising followed by distribution so there's roughly a, a billion difference between the two and it was kind of the other way around with warner media the distribution was about two and a half billion more than the advertising so that's when you add the two figures together it, it means it makes the distribution come out on top and we have advertising then taking second place uh, so yeah but let's just have a look at the the totals here so for the total revenue for the pro formal combined was 17.667 billion so a little less than it was the previous year which was 18.195 billion um yeah and then the combined operating income was 2.838 billion so lower than the 3.899 as 898 billion the previous year and then just it be EBITDA has also fallen which is 7. Point, about 7.5 seven and, and it was previously about 8.3 so yes we've seen a bit of a drop here um so let's see what i've said so total revenue is just a bit there and operating income all failed year over year with operating income falling the most due to the addition of some restructuring charges not present the year before so yeah as we, we mentioned with the previous period it didn't account for any kind of consequences of the merger which as well as synergies also includes the restructuring costs so that's what we're seeing coming through here really um it's also perhaps worth highlighting that the integration of the warning media business has changed the revenue mix so as this is what i was saying previously advertising was the largest contributor followed by distribution now this has been reversed with distribution making up a higher proportion of the total so despite the results being low in 2022 the network segment is still the most profitable in the business and an important source of cash flows for investment in the other segments the anticipation of a gradual decline in revenues from networks as customers move from traditional cable television to streaming necessitates investment in alternative sources of income such as dtc so this is a, a crucial bit the the networks business is ex the network segment is expected to decline over time as as people move away from linear cable to streaming uh, which they can get perhaps cheaper they can, it's more versatile they can just do it on a phone they can do it on a laptop they have much more versatility and flexibility in in the model of of how they can they can use the service and what they can access with it and they've got a lot more options and choice perhaps so it's going to slowly move away from it but we've still got it's still a very strong business and it's still very profitable um and uh as we'll get on to with DTC the, the margins for the networks business currently are higher than than what you can get for the for the DTC potentially uh, in the future looking at sort of companies that have turned profitable with it DTC isn't yet profitable with Warner Bros Discovery but um, yeah we'll, we'll get into all that in a minute but yeah the uh, the fact that this it's a lower margin business but it means that you're going to have to get an expansion in the total sort of addressable market you can hit with it which would kind of make sense like i'm i've 
this is just anecdotal but i've never had or considered having any kind of like cable tv or sky we'd have in the uk um or virgin media or something like that i've never really had considered have any of that stuff i've never lived in a household that's had any of that stuff but done plenty of streaming of content online uh, for various servers and things so i'm fall into a i fall into a market segment that never would have been touched by uh, linear and cable media before so it's definitely a case for it expanding and hitting a much larger segment than, than it did before so anyway, let's move on to the direct to consumer segment the DTC so let's see what I've written here so as of 30th of September 2022 the company had a combined 94.9 million core DTC subscribers across its Discovery Plus HBO and HBO Max products this figure includes both direct retail subscriptions and wholesale subscriptions through third-party platforms like Amazon Channels. Work has been underway since the merger to create a new product that contains the company's full content library and realizes some of the synergies outlined earlier. This product is on track for release in spring 2023. So yeah, this is a key thing. They're looking to, now they've done the merger, they're looking to as we sort of mentioned earlier, those potential synergies, the the event-driven stuff from the HBO and HBO Max combined with the sort of daily consumption, a, a massive sort of daytime TV, uh, reality TV catalogue you've got with Discovery. Uh, combining those two together into a combined product is, is what they're really looking to, to do here. So um, that's what they've been working on and, and it should be hopefully released in the in the sort of first or second quarter of this year so spring i guess it's is first quarter just to the end of it um so yeah the that's the the key idea and uh, and but as i understand at the moment they're keeping they have all the existing platforms are still in place and they're continuing to uh i think i don't know whether at the moment they've got a I think they are probably going to move. What well, was see? I, I know they they they've sort of signed on deals with Amazon channels and stuff like that too. They, that got renewed in September last year, I think. So that basically means they're still going to wholesale their do wholesale subscriptions for HBO Max and Discovery Plus through Amazon channels. Um, it's so just a way to get those products out and keep going and i know in the uk so if i want to access any of the hbo content for instance like um i watched succession here before i have to do it through they've got licensing agreements with sky um, and we what to stream it i use now now tv which is their uh, streaming platform you just you pay a subscription each month and you can cancel any time standard standard model but yeah, so it seems to be a, with a lot of their international footprint at the moment. Um, they've got these license contracts, and I believe that's going to last quite a lot. I think it's still at least 2025 with the Sky and Now TV um, licensing agreement. So there's a, and I'm sure they've got similar things in place for other regions. So their international sort of expansion of their their own products is going to take a little bit longer to do because of the these licensing agreements. But I'm sure these licensing agreements. Are highly lucrative so uh, yeah we don't need to we don't need to worry about that um, so yeah let's have a look at the results for the nine months ended 30th of September 2022 below um, so got another one of those tables with the split with actual pro forma adjustments and pro forma combined um, so we can see the majority of the revenues came from distribution but all three revenue types grew compared to 2021 advertising showed the greatest growth on a percentage basis, 158% due to the release of an ad supported tier in mid 2021. So yeah, this is something they, they talk about quite a lot. Um, they're wanting to, to try and increase their, their ability to reach different customers on rather than just having a sort of premium subscription because they're looking if they do a combined product, they're probably going to want to increase the prices compared to what they were charging on the individual discovery plus and hbo max products um so maybe if you wanted to go for a completely uh, ad free model get it and get access to, to all the content you might be paying something like 
closer to cable prices i think they're a long-term thing they'd be wanting to look at something like 20 to 30 dollars maybe more uh, in in the long run but i don't think they they could do that competitively at the moment because of the the prices of you can get from netflix and what have you so they'd be limited to probably matching fairly closely what their competitors are, are charging uh, but those prices but places like netflix and so on are going up um but yeah another way to increase to increase their addressable market and to increase their their what they call arpu average revenue per user um is to have ad supported tiers and also free to view tiers or ftv so the free to view will be a, probably a cut down selection and and maybe the same with the ads the ad supported but in both cases they the free to view will be you get a lot of adverts and some people are happy with that some people just want to get the free content um and then you've got the the ad supported which will be lighter you just get a maybe one or two ads per per episode or whatever light sort of advertising going on there and you get um maybe a larger a larger content library so let's just have a look here so total revenues so yeah, as we we're saying the, the advertising has gone up so it was i think the previous year i don't I've got the figures for the previous year here but yeah it was 158 percent. so it was, the advertising actually came in at 284 million in total uh distribution was 6.437 billion content 509 million and just other was 12 million so total revenues adding all those up together was 7.242 billion and the adjusted EBITDA was a loss of 1.846 billion and operating income was an even greater loss of 4.417 billion so let's just have a look at what I've written here so adjusted EBITDA and operating income were both steeply negative and declined from the 2021 pro forma combined figures of 1.137 billion and 2.890 billion respectively the increase in adjusted ebitda was due to increased costs of revenues which outweighed imp improvements in sgna costs selling general administrative costs the operating loss was further compounded by 989 million dollars of restructuring and other charges related to the merger the management has said they expect the dtc segment to break even in 2024 and then generate $1 billion in, in profits globally in 2025. Long term, they expect the operating margin of the DTC business to be 20%, which largely aligns with those achieved by Netflix. See, so then I go on with another the paragraph which I'll just read out now, which is uh, covering the what I was saying earlier about the comparison between the margins of the linear business and DTC. So let's just have a look. These target margins are less than those of the current linear business but the potential product reach is far greater with the proportion of the global population buying cable subscriptions much less than the proportion streaming content this reach is further broadened when you add in free to view or ftv and add supported tiers for people unwilling to or unable to pay for a full subscription building and monetizing these ad tiers is an area where one of us discovery is likely to excel due to existing relationships with advertisers through its linear business. So potential strengths there. Right, so let's, uh, we've looked at the segments, now we're gonna move on to the overall financials for the, the combined company. So let's have a look. Before looking at the most recent financials for the combined company, I think it would be constructive to look back at the figures for Discovery and Warner Media provided in the merger prospectus. The pre-pandemic results are particularly useful for giving us a picture of the kind of performance we can expect in more normal trading conditions. So we've got the figures here for the revenue operating and net income figures for Discovery in 2020 and 2019 and Warner Media in the same years. So let's have a look at the revenues for Discovery. So in Discovery in 2019 they did 11.144 billion and in 2020 they did 10.671 billion. And let's just let's just do a comparison on the revenues to Warner Media. So in Warner Media in 2020, uh, 2019 they did 32.926 billion, 
and in 2020 they did 28.146 billion so there was a fairly notable both of them saw some kind of drop there but the drop in Warner Media was was much larger by the look of it and kind of what you would expect given that the uh, studios represent such a large part of their business and that would be much more uh, much have a much more affected by the uh, the lockdowns and pre preventing productions and preventing theaters being opened and so on so then we move on to the operating income and so we can see that discovery in 2019 had about 3 billion just over 3 billion and in 2020 they had two and a half billion so for Warner Media they had 3 billion 3.083 billion in 2019 but in 2020 they had just 413 million so is there a massive drop off there in the, uh, the operating income for Warner Media but not so much for Discovery so in and in net income it's a similar story uh, Discovery had 2.213 billion and it dropped down to 1.355 billion so a bit of a bigger a difference there well about the same 500 million roughly um, but percentage wise larger and then for Warner Media we saw a big drop but it's a very very similar figure in 2019 of 2.28 billion uh, but it dropped down to just 12 million in 2020 so here we've said here I've given a little analysis of this I said what's striking is that Discovery was producing very similar levels of operating and net income to Warner Media, but from one third the revenues. This would suggest that a significant part of the merger synergies envisioned will come from margin improvements in the Warner Media business. I've gone to say there are, however, differences between the two businesses that make it more complicated than simply replicating the operating practices of Discovery. For example, much of the content shown on Discovery's networks is unscripted and a significantly lower production cost than the scripted content produced by Warner Media. Essentially here you're dealing with higher operating leverage in the Warner Media business, which likely means the emphasis is going to be on producing the content that generates the highest revenues rather than trying to bring down production costs significantly. So yeah, we've this key the crucial thing there is that Discovery's stuff is producing a lot of daytime TV, unscripted stuff just um, all sorts of shows like uh, 90 Day Fiance and all stuff like that. Well, maybe that's got some scripting going on, but it's uh, it's not like a movie level production value uh, or the sort of co production value you'd expect for Game of Thrones or other shows like that, which are going to be higher grossing but much higher, much higher production costs. Um, but th this basically means that, and this is what the management's now doing, as they've done quite a lot cut quite a lot of shows since the acquisition uh, that were being produced by uh, by HBO and they're, they're really just targeting they're whittling it down to targeting to the ones that are going to be the the biggest revenue generators and the, and the most profitable so they're really focusing on that now and um, and that's that's in large part what's contributed to a lot of the to the losses and so on that we've seen uh, and the reductions in in income in operating income numbers so yeah speaking of income let's move on to, to have a look at the next bit so let's have a look at the consolidated statements of operations for the nine months ended 30th of september 2022 from the latest 10q so since the merger on, only occurred on the 8th of april 2022 and the period covered starts on the 1st of january 2022 it will probably be beneficial to use the pro forma combined figures provided by management rather than the gap figures. So yeah, we're going to use the pro forma figures again. Um, but don't worry, we're not going to any tables this time. I'm just going to, it's all just nicely in paragraphs. So total revenues came to 32.08 billion, of which 18.519 billion was attributable to distribution, 8.215 billion to content, and 7.651 billion to advertising. This is slightly down on the total revenues for the same period in 2021 of 32.913 billion. Total costs and expenses were 
36.309 billion with 19.357 billion coming from costs of revenues, 8.9 billion from sales, general and administrative, SGNA, and 5.536 billion from depreciation and amortization and 2.469 billion from restructuring and other charges. This was an increase on the previous year total of 34.443 billion, attributable to increased cost of revenues and the restructuring charges following the merger. Subtracting these costs and expenses from total revenues gives us an operating loss of 4.222 billion versus 1.530 billion the previous year. So a loss in both years, but uh, on a pro forma basis, but a larger one this year, or the most recent. Yeah. Without the pro forma adjustments, the operating loss figure was five point was five point four seven six billion versus an operating profit of one point five zero four million uh, billion in twenty twenty one. So a big change there. Uh, without the pro forma adjustments, Discovery was making one and a half billion in twenty twenty in the same period in twenty twenty one. The gap figure is lower due to one point two five four billion dollars of operating profit achieved by the Warner Media business in the months prior to the merger. The net loss for Warner Brothers Discovery, calculated using the gap operating loss figure, was negative 5.218 billion versus a net profit of 1.106 billion in 2021 attributable, attributable only to discovery. This includes the subtraction of 1.219 billion in net interest expense counterbalanced by 1.201 billion in income tax benefit. So yeah we can see the I'll, uh, I'm going to highlight now the increased cost in interest expense is substantial now that we've now that one of discovery has taken on that roughly f the total debt now is roughly 50 billion compared to just over 10 billion um, I think it was something like 14 billion prior to the merger so substantial increase in interest expense as as we can as well as we'll see from the comparison next so as a result of the substantial amount of debt assumed through the merger, the net interest expense figures has increased significantly. This is illustrated by comparing the third quarter net interest expense for 2022 of 555 million. There's a lot of places where, <laughs> where the num you get uh, three numbers repeated, which is uh, a little bit um, <laughs> suspicious to me. But uh, anyway, these things do happen. Um, by comparing the net interest expense for 2022 of 555 million to the 2021 figure of 159 million. On an annual basis we can expect net interest expense to exceed two billion dollars. So it's uh, quite a big thing to, considering we were looking at before a discovery you had net income, we well, had operating income of roughly three billion dollars. Um, and that was in that was for a whole year. We're uh, we're now looking at two billion dollars of interest expense alone. So yeah, it's quite a big jump, but which is going to have to be covered by the uh, the Warner Media revenues, I think, um, for it to be overall a benefit. So another figure used internally by management, and this is we're going to outline the adjusted EBITDA now, uh, which I roughly mentioned earlier. Um, so another figure used internally by management to assess the underlying performance of their operations is adjusted to EBITDA, which is calculated by subtracting cost of revenues and SG&A expenses, excluding share-based compensation and third-party transaction and integration costs from total revenues. This came to 5.115 billion for the nine months ended 30th of September 2022, versus 2.680 billion in 2021. So quite a big jump there. Uh, but again, this is before interest tax, so you can take away you know, 
a substantial chunk of that for the interest. Management has given their expectation for adjusted EBITDA to be $12 billion for, for the financial year 2023. With So that's a, a pretty big uh, jump we're looking at there for, well, obviously it was the three months. It was only, it was, sorry, it was only nine months, that 5.115 billion figure, but we're looking at a, um, so yeah, that would have been, add another quarter onto that would have been a bit more, but yeah, we're taking a pretty big jump up to 12 billion they're expecting for 2023. Um, and this was with four to six billion dollars of this being translated to free cash flow. So this was with the these figures of these uh, expectations, the forecasts were with the caveat that it will depend on the strength or lack thereof of the advertising market. So I've said I would expect a significant portion of this adjusted EBITDA figure to come from merger synergies now anticipate, anticipated to be in the range of three to three and a half billion dollars, with the realization of two billion dollars in 2023. That's what they've uh, have anticipated two billion in 2023. So. Yeah, it would have been without that take away the two billion there. They've got to make make that figure up to ten billion dollars there from uh, just general operating performance, which, given the increased number of of theatrical releases, double like they said, um, sounds sounds possible. And then you take away all of the uh, the other expenses, so. Something else worth noting is that EBITDA figure, like I said, includes cost of revenues. Now, cost of revenues, they include the impairment and amortization. So even though it says depreciation and amortization is not included, the cost of revenues does actually include the uh, impairment and amortization of television and movie content rights. So there is a substantial and, and I believe a substan there was a substantial amount of that of impairment and amortization done post the merger so that figure will have been pulled down quite a bit by that so that's another thing that's going to uh, make the improve the figures favorably uh, for 2023 so let's move on now to have a look at the uh, the balance sheet so and this for this one, the, this is the consolidated balance sheets as of the 30th of September 2022, which was the, the time I wrote this report, the latest reported, uh, the most recent figures. So current assets were 12.672 billion, consisting of 2.422 billion in cash and cash equivalents, 6.669 billion in receivables, and 3. 581 billion in prepaid expenses and other assets. So set this set against this were current liabilities amounting to 14.7676, uh, sorry, 14.676 billion dollars composed of 1.534 billion dollars of accounts payable, 10.197 billion dollars of accrued liabilities, 1.688 billion dollars of deferred revenues, uh, which are actually in fact, deferred revenues is just prepaid income. Uh, so it's, yeah, it confused me a little bit that one because it was normally referred to as in IFRS terms as prepaid income. But yeah, put that one up. And 1.257 billion dollars attributable to the current portion of the debt. So notably, these current liabilities exceed the current assets with a current ratio of 0 0.86 compared to 2.10 for the 31st of December 2021. Looking back at the Warner Media accounts for the 30th of September, 20, 30th of September 2021, so as reported in the, in the prospectus, uh, we can see a similarly poor current ratio of 0 0.84. So AT&T was running it with uh, not many current assets on the uh, on the Warner Media balance sheet. So it appears to be a feature of the Warner Media business rather than discovery. While there may be some seasonality to these figures, it's still a cause for concern with regards to liquidity. Looking back at the quarterly financials of Discovery and some of its competitors, you can see a current ratio in excess of one is maintained throughout the year. 
I would therefore expect management to move back to this policy soon. So that's how they run out. Total assets were 136.049 billion dollars with intangible assets and goodwill making up the majority of this at 46.744 billion and 34.45 billion respectively. So that's a pretty pretty big chunk there. Uh, film and television content rights and games contributed a further 28.288 billion dollars. While there's undoubtedly a lot of intangible value in the Warner Media assets, I don't think we can say they're immune to impairment. There's already been a significant amount of amount since the merger, as the management has reevaluated the value of the assets acquired. In addition, there isn't much in the way of tangible assets to shoot up the balance sheet with only five point one four three billion dollars of property and equipment. Total liabilities were eighty five point nine six nine billion with non the non current portion comprising debt of forty eight point six one two billion deferred income taxes of twelve point three one seven billion and other liabilities of ten point three six four billion so subtracting these liabilities and redeemable non controlling interest from the assets gives us a total equity of forty nine point seven six two billion of which forty eight point 517 billion was is attributable to Warner Brothers Discovery shareholders. With the rest being attributable to non-controlling interests. From these figures we can calculate the debt ratio debt to equity ratio as roughly 100%. This figure is not exceptionally large and is comparable to many other companies including the Dis Discovery pre-merger which had a debt to equity ratio of 113%. The sustainability of debt of a debt level like this depends on the stability of earnings, which is why you'd commonly see a lot of leverage on the balance sheets of utilities companies providing essential services like water and electricity. So some of the other companies I actually uh, did a little comparison to were things like Paramount and uh, another companies like at and other companies, it, comparable businesses, and I think Paramount has a lower debt to equity now. But in in prior years, it's been it's had over a hundred percent, for instance. So historically, Discovery's business has produced relatively stable earnings, as shown in the chart below. So we've got a chart here showing the operating income, and it's going all the way up from one billion in two thousand and eight all the way up to over three billion in 2019 and it, in that whole period it didn't have a, a negative year so it's steady and and growing and there were a couple of jumps in there from so from an acquisition like the acquisition of um what was the name I can't remember, but the, the acquisition that occurred in 2018 uh scripts that's it scripts 2018 it's got a bit pretty big jump there and there was a second year after the acquisition when they had implemented the synergy and so on. There was another sort of 500 million added on in 2019. So yeah, nice, fairly stable, growing operating income. The kind of stuff that's ideal for, for holding quite a lot of debt on the balance sheet. Um, so management has expressed their intention to bring the leverage ratio calculated as net debt divided by adjusted EBITDA down to below 3 to 1 within the next 18 months. So currently I think it's something like 5.75 or something like that. Um, at the moment it's quite, it's quite a bit higher than that um, as of the last reported figures. So in addition, they are bound by their debt covenants to maintain interest cover of at least three to one. So that's the operating income divided by the uh, the interest expense and a leverage ratio less than five to one. So again, the, the net debt, so total debt divided by uh, minus the, the cash uh, divided by the adjusted EBITDA of less than five to one for the first anniversary of the merger and so that'll be 
April 2023, decreasing to 4.5 to 1 by the second anniversary, so April 2024. So the following table breaks down the debt by maturity and type and includes the weighted average interest rate for each group. In aggregate, the company's debt had an average maturity of 14 years and an average interest rate of 4.2% as of the 30th of September 2022. See how they've broken it down here in terms of maturity. So we've got groups here, uh, maturity and type. So we've got term loans with maturities of three years or less, and they have a weighted average interest rate of 3.83%. And there's, there was, as of the 30th of September 2022, there was $4 billion worth of those. Floating rate senior, lo uh, senior notes with maturities of five years or less, 4.71%. And there was 500 million of those. Senior notes with maturities of five years or less, 3.62%. Uh, and there was 13.627 billion of those. Um, senior notes with maturities between 5 and 10 years, 4.25% interest, uh, and there was $10.373 billion of those. And senior notes with maturities greater than 10 years there was, had an interest rate, average interest rate of 5.11%, uh, and there was $21.644 billion of those. So to get that average maturity of 14 years, there must have been some much older ones in there. And I think um, when I did look at the figures, there were some very long maturities in there, which uh, pulled the average right up. Um, but yeah, the interest rate is uh, on average across them all is just 4.2%. And then, um, there was some adjustments, so you add all those up and you get $50.144 billion of debt, which is more than what we mentioned before. So that's because there's uh, an, unamor an unamortized discount, premium, debt issuance costs, and fair value adjustments for acquisition accounting of $275 million, which brings us down to the figure we've heard before of $49.869 billion. The company also has access to an additional $6 billion through a revolving credit agreement, which is restricted by the covenants outlined above. As of the 30th of September 2022, the credit facility was undrawn and management has stated that they are in compliance with all debt covenants. Ah, so I, did, I got the leverage ratio, misremembered it. The leverage ratio is uh, currently is 5.1 to 1 calculated with the adjusted EBITDA for the trading 12 months uh, and this agrees with the statement that all the, the compli in compliance with the debt covenants because uh, presumably they'll get this figure down to so I think from the point of the merger it was 5.75 to 1 was the requirement and that had to be down to 5 to 1 by April this year 2023 so they're on track to do that um, but then I've said here, I'm not sure how they've calculated the interest cover to make it comply since the company has reported an operating loss for the previous nine months, giving the net interest, uh, given that the net interest is likely to be approximately two billion for the full year, you'd expect the operating income to need to be six billion dollars or greater. We'll have to see whether this statement of compliance changes in the annual report. So yeah, I don't know whether there's going to be like a cutoff period by which this the operating income needs to have been uh, covering it by the required ratio of three to one. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see whether the statement of compliance changes. Uh, anyway, let's have a look. So now we can have a look. Finally, um, after looking at the the income and the balance sheet, we're now going to have a look, look at the cash flow. So as stated earlier, the net loss for the nine months ended 30th of September 2022 was $5.218 billion. So reconciling this to the cash provided by operations of $1.458 billion, um, or in 2021, $1.914 billion, required the following notable adjustments. The adjustment 
uh, sorry, the addition of eleven point four four one billion dollars for content amortization rights and impairments. That's what I was mentioning earlier, um, which is included. A lot of that's included in the uh, cost of revenues. I think I mentioned that in the next paragraph, so we'll get onto that. And five point zero two four billion dollars for general depreciation and amortization. Um, so those two were added on. And then we've got the subtraction of two point one zero five billion dollars for deferred income taxes and eight point six one two billion dollars spent on film and television content rights, games and net payables. So as we can see, a lot was spent on content during this period, which aligns with management's statement that theatrical releases will double in twenty twenty three. However, the figure was still substantially less than the total amortized and impaired, much of which was hidden in costs of revenues in the income statements. That's what I was saying. This reflects the fact that quite a number of production projects were cancelled after the merger, following management's strategic content programming assessments, which I interpret to mean they're cutting anything that doesn't meet certain expected profitability thresholds. Cash provided by investing activities came to $3.742 billion, largely due to $3.609 billion acquired through the Warner Media merger. A further $722 million came from the proceeds of derivative instruments, offset against $623 million spent on purchases of property and equipment. So yeah, they got quite a bit of cash from the merger. There was also something um, happened with the receivables. So I think the um, AT&T was given the choice of keeping. I can't remember the exact details, but there was some. There was there were some receivables which AT&T had the choice of either taking receiving the payment for those receivables um, themselves, in which case they would. Pay, uh, make a payment of cash to Warner Bros Discovery or they could pass the receivables on to Warner Bros Discovery and let them claim the full amount. I think there ended up being a cash payment there to, to close that one off. So cash used in financing activities came to 6.470 billion um, primarily so that was a, a negative figure so that was how much was used primarily attributable to $6 billion of term loan repayments. Um, there was also 585 million, there was also the $885 million issuance and repayment of commercial paper. So this is presumably rolling over a previous borrowing since they issued and repaid the same amount. Adding the cash flows from operating, investing, and financing activities together gives a net change in cash, cash equivalents, and restricted cash of negative $1.392 billion versus a positive uh, increase of $1.004 billion in the same period of 2021. This left cash, uh, this left $2.5 won three billion dollars of cash cash equivalents and restricted cash at the end of the period as stated earlier management expects free cash flow to be in the range of six to four, uh, four to six billion dollars in 20, 2023 equating to 33 to 50 percent of adjusted EBITDA longer term they are targeting 60 percent conversion of adjusted EBITDA to free cash flow if all goes according to plan with the merger synergies and DTC becomes profitable in 2025 you could be looking at adjusted EBIT to somewhere around $15 billion, which would translate to approximately $9 billion in free cash flow at their target conversion ratio. Right, so that's good. That's all the financials done. Now I'm going to have a, a walk you through management, uh, give you an overview of management, and walk you through the executive comp compensation, which is uh, post the deal is quite considerable. So the company's president and CEO is David Zaslav, who has, he has led the company since 2006. Over his tenure, the company has grown substantially in size and profitability through a combination of organic growth and acquisitions. Prior to joining Discovery, David played an instrumental role in developing and launching CNBC at NBC Universal. 
David has also benefited from the guidance of John Malone of the Outsiders fame, chairman of Liberty Media, Liberty Broadband and Liberty Global, who has served on the board of Discovery since 2008 and holds a significant stake in the company worth close to $300 million. As part of the merger, AT&T appointed seven board members, including Chairman Samuel de Piazza, former CEO of accounting firm PwC. The remaining board members were appointed to, by Discovery and include Stephen Miron Stephen and Stephen Newhouse, who are both affiliated with Warner Brothers Discovery's largest shareholder, Newhouse Broadcasting Corporation. So they, yeah, they own a pretty substantial uh, stake of the company. I can't remember the exact uh, figure. Um, it's also good to see board members with significant stakes in the company as this creates alignment between the interests of shareholders and management. On this subject, it's worth mentioning that David Zaslav currently holds shares in the company worth just under $60 million. Another positive I've taken from listening to the company's quarterly earnings calls and reading transcripts from interviews with members of the executive team is a focus on free cash flow generation in all of their business segments. This is encouraging, especially with DTC, which has historically been a business subject to a gross at all cost mentality. So yeah, I've I've read some interview transcripts and um, and listened to some earnings calls with with David Zaslav, and it's uh, interesting. Is so in his time working for uh, with Discovery, which he's been with since two thousand six, he's been uh, working closely with John Malone so he's get benefited from John Malone's experience he's quite famous um, in the media industry and uh, as mentioned he's met he's he's in the uh, one of the key figures covered in the outsiders by uh, William Thorndike as a study of great capital allocators um, I was famous for sort of using when his stock became overvalued using it using the equity issuing new equity to buy companies and then when the stock was massively undervalued you'd take on massive amounts of debt to uh to buy back shares because that was a a very profitable way um a capital efficient way to to uh deploy the company's profits and uh in this case debt um so yeah the another thing worth mentioning though is that david actually when he was working for uh, NBC Universal uh, and help launch uh, developing and launching CNBC. NBC Universal at the time was is was owned by General Electric, and so he actually had some experience working under um, what's his name, Jack, 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 Jack. It's <laughs> quite embarrassing, though. Um, Jack Welch, that's it. Yeah, Jack Welch. I was listening to a podcast the other day, actually. Uh, on um, it was a, a breakdown of uh, of the history of General Electric, and uh, yeah, found out a bit more about. I knew there was a so David Zaslav mentioned in an interview that he'd learned quite a lot. He'd worked with Jack Welch and learned quite a lot from from him, as as well as uh, from John Malone. Um, but I, I didn't quite know the uh, the connection uh, until uh, finding out a bit more about the history of General Electric and that they uh, they I don't not sure where they own it currently I'm guessing they do but previously at the time owned NBC Universal and CNBC. So let's have a look at the executive compensation. So David Zaslav receives a base salary of three million dollars, which is fixed under a new employment agreement until thirtieth the 31st of December 2027. In addition to this, he receives a target annual bonus of $22 million dependent on meeting certain quantitative and qualitative targets which are re-evaluated yearly. If these targets are exceeded, he is eligible to receive up to 125% of his target bonus. These cash-based payments represent a relatively small part of the overall compensation package with the remainder coming in the form of equity. One part of this issuance of 12 million, uh, one part of this is the issuance of 12 million dollars in performance restricted stock units (PRSUs), which are bound by the same performance targets as the cash bonus. 
The largest component, however, comes from stock options amounting to I'll, uh, get yourself ready for this: two hundred and two million eight hundred and eighty-nine thousand seven hundred and sixty-four dollars. These are spread out over the duration of the contracted employment period, start ending thirtieth of December, twenty twenty-three, and have exercise prices starting from. $35.65 and increasing in tranches to $43.33. So as I'm going to highlight in the next paragraph, uh, while that seems like a lot, that would actually mean he'd need to more than double the stock price. He's currently underwater on that on those options and he'd need to more than double the stock price from here. So uh, even though he's getting a, a lot there, he would have to give shareholders some a pretty pretty substantial return from this point in order to to earn it um so it wouldn't be too painful really so while this is undeniably a very large amount of compensation all but the base salary of three million dollars is linked to performance and the stock options are worthless unless the stock price more than doubles from its current value of approximately fifteen dollars i think it's come down a little bit since i wrote that as well um so yeah, so just on the subject of stock price, it was a uh, pretty painful while I was uh, while I was writing this. Um, I started started researching this company at the right at the beginning of January, and over that month, the stock went up about fifty five percent or something. So I was just uh, watching the stock price climbing. Um, so yeah, but it was a real test of can you keep going with it and uh, and make sure a bit of self discipline, not buying it until I until I'd done my due diligence and uh, finish the process so um yeah I, and i got to the the end of well i, I think i published this on the 6th of 6th of february so it was about a month later um and yeah and it looks like the the stocks kind of stopped at about 15 dollars, and it's come down slightly since then i believe um but yeah so it's still trading around that level but as we'll as i'll uh we'll get on to valuation at the, at the end but um yeah, so I've said this. So this, uh, the fact that he's got the stock options are effectively worthless unless he the stock price more than doubles, and the fact that all the uh, the bonuses and the uh, the performance restricted stock units are, are linked to his performance. So that's more underlying revenue and and uh, EBITDA and op operate cash flow targets and so on, um, as well as some qualitative factors. Uh, so I'm guessing things like um, I'm not, I can't remember what the qualitative ones are, but the standard kind of stuff. Uh, so this creates a substantial alignment of interest between the CEO and shareholders. So, yeah, I'll just make a little note at the end here. The other executives have a similarly performance-focused compensation structure, but with much smaller option awards, and individually their total compensation is less than 10% of David Zaslav's. So, <laughs> so pretty uh, stark divide and I think if you add them all together it was some the ratio between like the CEO's pay on the the average employee was some ungodly number of like 22,000 to one or something uh, if you if you include those stock options which uh, obviously are uh, performance dependent um, and it's somewhat out of his hands with the stock price as well but uh, anyway yeah so yeah that's uh, that wraps up the management executive compensations let's have a look now at the risks um, so there are quite a few short-term macro risks to which the company is exposed with varying degrees of likelihood and impact examples include a general slowdown in the advertising market a pandemic resurgence resulting in more lockdowns and a recession that reduces consumer appetite for discretionary spending so then I go on to explore these these examples so a slowdown in the advertising market would undoubtedly be negative for the company since it currently relies on advertising through its networks to generate a substantial portion of its profits. This would also be likely to slow the progress towards profitability of the DTC segment as a significant part of their strategy revolves around ad supported and free to view tiers. It is likely that an advertising slowdown would coincide with a general economic slump so the company may also have trouble monetizing their content in other ways. A resurgence of the pandemic is hopefully the least likely scenario, but the impacts would probably be mixed. Production and theatrical release 
would be hit, but DTC could receive a boost as we saw in 2020 and 2021. In the long run, these factors are probably inconsequential provided they don't affect the company's ability to make interest and principal repayments on its debt. So, Debt is one of the key risks we need to consider as the next few years are going to be critical as they will be the period of peak, of peak leverage. Essentially, it's going to be a matter of generating sufficient cash flow to service and reduce the debt burden. Here though, the management has quite a few levers they can pull. I'll give some examples. Right now, they're pouring a lot of cash into the DTC segment, not only through development and marketing, but also through exclusive content that could otherwise be licensed to third parties. Removing the exclusivity of this content is a way they could generate some cash if necessary. So this is just one example, but with such a large diversified business, you've got quite a lot of options there for how they can generate cash as required. So they, as we've said with the different segments, they've got the studios, the networks, and then uh, the DTC. So yeah, if the DTC's, if, if they're getting into a bit of a crunch and the DTC's not being profitable, they can start to to generate, to get, some more cash, squeeze some more cash out of the other segments um, rather than uh, effectively using it to subsidize the DTC segment and, and pay in, pay for investment in that segment as, as they're doing at the moment. Um, right, let's have a look. So here we've touched on another potentially major risk, which is that the investment in DTC doesn't pay off and it never becomes profitable. In the balance of probabilities, I find this unlikely given the strength of the company's IP assets. However, if this, if this were to happen, you'd still have the studios, which are, which are likely to endure, and the networks, which despite a forecast of gradual decline, are likely to remain profitable for many years to come. So yeah, one, one thing men worth mentioning with the, um, with the networks is that something that does keep quite a lot of people currently in in america and so and this is why perhaps i've never had cable before is that i'm not particularly interested in in live sports so um but a lot of people are and so that's one of the main reasons why people uh are, are still yeah quite it's quite sticky with their cable products um and cable packages even though they're they're quite often very expensive and so this actually brings up another point which is um, not something I mentioned in this report but I, I did make some notes on it is they discussed in one of the um, the interview transcripts I, I was reading uh, about I think one of the questions was about whether they would do kind of what Paramount's doing at the moment which is um, I believe they have uh, the NFL, NFL which uh, forgive me I'm British so we don't really uh, do it follow American football much here but I believe the NFL is the American football um, National Football League uh, and I believe Paramount has this locked in um, the content rights to it and they if you get the Paramount Plus subscription in America you have access to this uh, I don't think you have access to it if you if you buy Paramount Plus in the UK so it's just a, a US specific thing uh, and this is this is a big attraction that it's going to be a real selling point for AFL. So what's interesting is is um, Discovery actually has, I think, the rights to the NBA, uh, so basketball. So that's um, from a conversation I uh, had with Jason, the afternoon investor. He was telling me that NFL is actually, I thought NBA was uh, quite a big thing, and I'm, I'm sure it is, but it's still smaller compared to... Uh, NFL, the NFL, the uh, American football. So uh, it's interesting to learn that little nugget from Jason. There. Um, but yeah, so the my point is they were, they were asked in this interview whether they would consider doing the same thing as, as Paramount and integrating the sports into the DTC streaming product. Um, and the, there were interesting arguments on either side of this. So one was that Yes, it, it would be a draw and it would uh, help with, with churn, it would help reduce churn, help people stick to the product. But when you do something like that, you're effectively, your sports viewers um, are being subsidized by people who are not interested in sports, like myself, um, 
well not to say I'm not entirely interested in it but it's it's not really something I would consider paying for and and uh, so it's yeah I would effectively if I were to buy that product be subsidizing uh, the people who if, if it was included as a bun you know in the, the price of the products and they didn't have it as an as an add-on so if they had it as a um, uh, including the price as a way to to draw and try and retain retain viewers so yeah that's just an interesting thing and I think they um, I think it was a little undecided we'll, we'll see how that, that works out whether they do something like that because um, they also have in, in Europe they have access to uh, I think they've got to deal with BT Sports now to get some of the European uh, football leagues and so on um, so yeah they've, they've got other sports assets what globally and I think they had the um, rights to the Olympics to show the Olympics as well so uh, yeah something crucial here is that most sports viewing is still very much a live event people want to watch this stuff live and so that's why you know a key reason why things like um, the, the network segment the linear TV the cable uh, is likely to stick around for longer than longer than perhaps we'd expect people that are currently paying for pay cable to get these uh, access to these sports uh, the live sports are, un, are are less likely to quit unless unless you start getting the same sports in streaming options but if you've got a, with the case generally it is that one company has the rights to show them um, so they would have to have decided to make them available on either license them out to other streaming platforms uh, to other companies or, or put them on their own streaming platform so that that would be a conscious choice to move away from the network so anyways that was a long winded way of saying that sports is a, is one case why networks might stick around for a bit longer than, than people think um right so look so yeah final little point i made here on risks it also bears mentioning with regard to the long-term success of the company that there are a number of people internally who are highly motivated for it to succeed not least the ceo with his circa 200 million dollars of options um this gives me some faith that they will deliver so yeah finally we wrap up with the uh the valuation uh which here we go as discussed earlier management expects free cash flow for financial year 2023 to be in the range of four to six billion dollars so you could conservatively put a 10x multiple on this and say that the company should be valued between 40 to 60 billion dollars which would be greater than the current market capitalization of 37 billion dollars in share price terms this would put you between 16 to 25 dollars versus the current 15 dollars so a little bit of a, a little bit of an upside there on the the current year's sort of forecast scenario realistically though this significantly undervalues the company as illustrated by the minimum exercise price of David Zaslav's share options of $35.65 there are a lot of variables but if we assume the merger synergies generate the expected three to three and a half billion dollars and the DTC segment becomes profitable on schedule an eight to nine billion dollar free cash flow figure seems quite reasonable within a few years on a 10x free cash flow basis this would put the value of the company between 80 to 90 billion dollars or 33 to 37 dollars per share if all the DTC business does in the long run is replace the networks then you might not see much growth beyond this but if it fulfills its promise and expands the addressable market of the company there could be substantial upside so if it's able if it hits people uh, like me that never would have subscribed to HBO in the past for instance in this case it is also unlikely that the the company would trade on the lowly 10x free cash flow multiple I've used in my calculations maybe something like 12 to 15 times or or you see some of yeah let's not even look at Netflix but that's uh, substantially higher 
Putting all this together, the company seems attractively valued at present, and I could generate very substantial. Oh, sorry, not I, and could generate very substantial returns for shareholders in the coming years. I would not be put off by the fact the stock has risen 50% since the start of the year. There's still plenty of upside to capture from here. So that's sort of like uh, what I was saying earlier. Um, but it's uh, since I started writing it, it's gone up. I think it's something like 55% which is a, a real test of uh, <laughs> self-resilience and uh, discipline there. But uh, yeah, the uh, so I have I personally have bought, entered a position at around about just, just over $15 and with the price coming down now, I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably going to add to it. I'm, I'm hoping it's gonna, it's gonna keep going down. It'd be great if it went back down to that sort of $10 it was at uh, <laughs> at the start of the year. But uh, anyway, well, uh, Let's just see what happens, but I don't think uh, David Zaslav would be very happy if that did happen, um, given his share options. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's the end. So that's my uh, my s stock analysis. You can read the full thing over at firmreturns dot com. Um, and if by chance you've stumbled upon this podcast or this article with. Uh, Without going through Twitter, I also am on Twitter, so you can follow me there, just uh, at Firm Returns. So uh, with capital F and capital R. Um, and I, I generally post a few different uh, posts, semi, semi regularly with that. I post a sort of podcast I'm listening to and so on. And as I'm as I've been analysing businesses in the past, including this Warner Brothers one at Warner Brothers Discovery stock, I've, I'll maybe sort of do a kind of research journal in there um doing some things um and then i'll you know then i if you if you ha if you're not subscribed to the newsletter which which all of these uh posts on firmreturns.com go out in a newsletter as well which you can subscribe to um if you're not subscribed to that uh, you can also I'll, I'll generally post them on on twitter so you can if you follow me there you can you can see them there and you know if, if if you've got any questions or comments or anything about this stuff feel free to reach out to me you can reach out to me via email there's email address and so on is on my website but it's basically just info at firmreturns.com or you can contact me uh, on twitter on uh, dms or whatever stuff like that yeah so yeah I'd, like i say first podcast so i'm sure it was very rough around the edges and uh very painful to listen to but if you made it to the end uh, thanks a lot and uh, I hope yeah let me know if you well I'll, I'll probably keep making them anyway and hopefully they'll improve but yeah give me feel free to give me some feedback positive or negative on it and um, yeah and see you next time